All throughout the Gospels, Jesus seems to contradict conventional wisdom. He just turns ideas about God and community upside down. He flips them all around. And perhaps there's no better example than our gospel reading from, the, from today in John 12. He just came from marching into Jerusalem with everybody saying, Jesus, Jesus, Hosanna. In just a few days, he'd be lifted up, tortured as a criminal on a cross. And he says these words. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate it in this world will keep it for eternal life. These are difficult words. He goes on to say, whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Okay, so you combine that with our Wesley Covenant prayer that we've been studying over these weeks. And today's words are, and you sung them so beautifully, thank you so much. Let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Who's signing up to be brought low or laid aside? Anybody? No, really, anybody? No. This is difficult stuff. This is really hard. It's disturbing. I mean, it goes against the grain. Another horrible jerk that didn't work in either 8.30, 9.30, or 11. But I kept it anyway. I liked it. Brothers and sisters, the gospel really goes against, what Jesus is recorded words saying, really goes against everything. The way we're wired up, our instinctual desires, our inmost being. I mean, we really want to put a ladder against a life of success. We want to climb a ladder in our jobs. We want to create wealth, create a comfortable life. It's what we want to do. We want to increase our power and influence. And you know, I think that was true for the disciples. I think that was true for the religious people. I think it's what nations strive for. I think it's what denominations strive for and churches strive for. And if we're honest, even if it's hidden, it's what we strive for. But Jesus says the exact opposite. He's saying the only way to go up is to actually go down. We have to go down the ladder. We have to set the ladder on something completely different, like Thomas Merton was talking about. And so before Jesus even started his public ministry, he went where? Into the desert to wrestle with what? These very things. It says in the scripture, in both Luke and Matthew, they move around the temptations a little bit, but they basically say, Jesus, rely on yourself. Don't rely on God, just rely on you. You're powerful enough. They say, show the miracles, throw yourself down, and let the people see you, save yourself. And then he says, just bow down to me and I'll give you all the power and control. These are the very thing, same things that we must wrestle with, brothers and sisters. None of us want to be laid aside. None of us want to be brought low. If we're honest, we want to be exalted and we want to be employed. And that's not all bad. So, what's your ladder leaning against? at home, at work, or at church? Those are questions that I think are important for us to wrestle with. And you know, I think when we try to climb the ladder of success without Christ being at the center, there is most often a crash. There is most often a fall from grace. And there's no one that knew that better than our 
famous, lovely founder, John Wesley. I, when I was studying for this, I was like, I was really perturbed. I was like, how was he able to write this prayer of surrender? How, what were the conditions that allowed him to pen this prayer later in life? And, you know, for those of you that don't know United Methodist history, this will give you a little bit. And for many of you that know it, you can go to sleep for the next three to four minutes. John Wesley learned this lesson firsthand, that his, letter, his ladder was set on the things maybe not squarely on Christ and the cross. He, be, he was a good boy. He was a good boy who liked to do things right, who liked to do things that were good. And so he became a priest in his early 20s, reared up pretty nicely, about one of 19, and he became a holy man. He did lots of good things. He prayed, he fasted, he got up early in the morning. He was a rigid dude. <laughs> he really was. He, was. he was kind of wired tight. But you know what his ladder was set on in his early life? His ladder was set on works-based righteousness. That's a churchy word for if I just am good enough, God will love me. If I do enough good things, if I'm just a good person, Christ will save me. But he too discovered that it's not in your strength and it's not in your gifts. It's not in the things that you do well that you most experience the significant and deep grace of Jesus Christ. But it's often in your weakness and in your surrender and in your suffering. Very antithetical to what we're taught. So, I want to submit to you that there were a few key life events for John, there are probably many more, but I'm only going to give you two, that I think really like tilled his heart to allow him to write such a powerful prayer that we're trying to learn. The first of which was an encounter with death. He had that twice in his life, but this one that I'm going to tell you about was on a ship. And there is nothing, and, and some of you know this, there is nothing that will have you reevaluate your life than a brunch with death. It will, evaluate, it will help you evaluate your current life, and it will help evaluate your relationship with God. Brushes with death do that. And that's what happened to John. John was on this ship going to a missionary journey. He was going to convert people. And the ship went through this amazing storm. And every, well, I should say every, there was a portion of the people on the ship that were terrified. They were the English. John was in that camp. Here it was, a priest, a priest who had done many good things for people, was terrified of death. And then the German Moravians were calm children. Women, men, singing hymns, ready to surrender if death was to come. This absolutely slayed John. It absolutely put him in a bad space to think about, well, what about my relationship with God? What about my standing internally? He really wrestled with it. The second was this failed mission trip. He was going to Georgia. He was going to be a missionary that would convert all these people. And it was an absolute disaster. If you read anything about it, it's, 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 it's fun reading, actually. It's sad but because we know the ending, but it, it was an absolute disaster. He thought he was going to do great things for God. And he failed. So it's this guy, fearful of death failed at what he thought God was calling him to do. That's the condition that he came back to England. And if things didn't change, we probably would have never read about John Wesley. But then something happened, and I want to suggest to you that perhaps for us, the same is true. Perhaps sometimes a failure, sometimes an illness, sometimes a divorce, sometimes a moral failure, are the fertilizer that allows God 
to bring out new life. It's antithetical to what we're taught and what we believe. The third was John went to church. He was still going to church because that's what good boys do. They go to church and he went in the morning and the, uh, the choir sang 130, Psalm 130. And it said in his journal that he connected with the psalmist who was crying out from the depths of God. And that's the condition of his soul. Later that night, he was invited to go to a Moravian meeting, to like a Bible study. And he said he didn't want to go. And I think sometimes that happens for us too. We don't want to get, you know, I don't want to go to church or we don't want to go to group or we don't want to pray. But sometimes God has something for us when we push through. So here's what he wrote in his journey. He wrote, in the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle of the, to the Romans about a quarter before nine while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ. I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt that I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation. And an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. This is a, a priest who was baptized, who had done many, many wonderful things for others. And it was at that moment that he understood that his ladder was on the wrong wall before and that now there's nothing that he could ever do to earn God's mercy. Nothing, good or bad. He experienced new life. And you know, John Wesley wasn't the only one who has a, you know, had problems uh, with going off his ladder or changing his ladder, being set on one wall and moving it to another. The other were the disciples and the Jews of the day. And we heard the scripture uh, read. And in John's gospel, it builds anticipation. And hopefully this might be new for some of you. So he's, Jesus starts with a saying the Jews would have recognized. In verse 23, he says, The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The Jews would have known what that meant. They would have known that, that phrase, the Son of Man. They would have known it because it came from Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 7, when Daniel has a dream, he has a dream of a Son of Man coming from heaven, out of the heavens to come down to earth and to squash the worldly powers and the savages and beasts and establish a ruling th throne that would be universal forever. In points to the scripture, you see, Jesus keeps saying, the time has not come. The time has not come. The time has not come. He has just marched in to Jerusalem. And now he says, brothers and sisters, the time has come. That would have brought anticipation that the Jews and the disciples were going to rise. But that's not exactly what he had in mind, did he? A different kind of kingdom was coming. A different kind of rising was going to come. Instead of assuming a worldly throne by conquest and overthrowing the worldly powers, he would assume a heavenly throne through powerlessness and the vision of the cross. I mean, if you think of the absolute craziness of that cross hanging there and a man hanging from it and us calling that power, it's absolutely paradoxical. Nothing, we don't even really believe it most of the time. We believe that it comes through power. And Jesus is saying, no, it comes through powerlessness. Many of you know, some of you don't, that I found new life in Christ through struggle with addiction and drugs and alcohol. 
And it was that place and that journey of powerlessness that I was able to more fully experience the grace and love of Jesus. Not everybody has to have an addiction to experience that. But I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, whatever's going on in your life, there are things that you won't be able to control. If you haven't encountered it yet, it's coming. And those are the places, this, those are the places at which you can set your ladder on Jesus. You can set your surrender on Jesus and he'll transform it. I know in this congregation, because I pray prayer requests and I talk to many of you, that some of you are in this season where you feel like you're brought low, whether it be an illness or a divorce or a family member that is stuck in addiction. And I want to tell you to hold on to hope, to hold on to the cross of Christ, because God can transform it. God does transform it when we surrender, when we jump off our ladder and say, I can't do this. It's yours. And so I want to suggest to you two things that this scripture and this Wesley prayer teaches us. And the first, if you just put the first one up, I'd appreciate it. That when we set our ladder on the cross, we discover that we find life in Christ through sometimes death, through sometimes the things we can't control. And when we move that ladder from whatever we have it set upon, and we move it on to Jesus, God will transform it. Now, hear me, it's not easy. The scripture even says, Jesus struggled with this. So if Jesus struggled, we're going to struggle surrendering. It's not easy. And maybe, like I said, maybe you're feeling something like that in your life. Or maybe you have some friend or loved one that's feeling that. And I want us to just take a moment, 10 or 15 seconds, to just pray. Ask God into it. Ask God to remove it. And ask that God might transform it so someday... It can glorify it. Someday, looking in the rearview mirror, out of that rubble and ash, that new life can be found. And we can go back and say, yes. Yes, it was on the cross. Yes, I had a divorce. Yes, I had a moral failure. Yes, I had an addiction. But I surrendered to God and God transformed it. And now I've been able to help someone else. Let's pray. We give thanks for your presence. Be with the prayer said and unsaid. Amen. The second thing I would love for you to remember and take home is that we, when we set our service on the cross of Jesus, we find new life. I think that's why everybody is loving this Pope, right? He got invited to the senator's luncheon. And he was like, no, thank you. I'm going to go hang out with people who are poor and powerless. I'm not going to drive. I'm going to be in a fiat. <laughs> if, you, if you put that next to some of the other world leaders and the way they travel, it's just quite interesting. You know? When we set our service to help the powerless, we find new life. We find new life. And I want to suggest to you, as John Wesley set his ladder from workspace righteousness into the cross of Christ, and as the disciples who thought this kingdom of power that they were going to reign in with Jesus on the left and on the right, they submitted that to powerlessness in this kingdom of love. As we do those things and we surrender, we are more able I didn't say totally. We are more able to pray the Wesley Covenant Prayer. 
So let's do that together. Now, can you put that up on the screen, please? Gets up. Can we start with a full prayer? Can we have the full prayer? It's okay. There it is. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee, or lay aside for thee. Exalted for thee, or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O oh, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Thou art mine, and I am thine. So be it, and the covenant which I have made on earth. 